So the performance gap in students uh, with writing continues to widen as they get older. And it's a painstaking task for them. So if you imagine how this guy feels in first or second grade, as that gap widens, imagine how he's feeling in middle school and high school and how things feel like they're becoming unbearable. And as, as a child ages, they don't just stall out. They don't just slow down. Sometimes they just completely stall out with their written language. And children who have proficiency with European story grammar, it helps them to understand other stories. So I have two types of students. Um, as a speech pathologist, I'll see kids twice a week for 30 minutes, or I'll often have a one 45-minute session, and that's all I get with them for the week. And so when they come to me, if they've been reading Island of the Blue Dolphins, and I say, okay, catch me up, what has been happening in the story? I get one of two responses. One of the responses is, I don't know, nothing, I have no idea. And I'll say something like, well, was there a dolphin? <laughs> uh, was, you know, I don't know. Was there an island? I don't know. <clears throat> That's one of the responses I get. The other response I get is they start at the beginning and they have to go through the whole thing. And they tell you every single detail. I can tell you have these same two students. You've all seen these same two students. What they don't have is a frame of reference for how to tell you what are the main ideas, what are the high points, and that's what we're gonna talk about today, is what is that frame that we can give them so that they can begin to organize stories in their mind, because that organization internally of stories is what helps them then to comprehend them, to be able to talk about them. As a speech language pathologist, I want them talking about stories before they're writing stories, to get in both the oral and written language piece, because if they can't talk about them, how are they ever going to be able to write about them? Text structure gives us a framework for remembering, understanding, and constructing stories of our own. So when you give them a blank graphic organizer and you want them to come up with a story, they don't know where to start because they don't conceptually have an understanding of that structure. So, we have rules it's an in, but it's an intrinsic rule. These are not rules like a checklist that we give them. These are intrinsic rules about stories. And you know this too. When you go to a movie, you have a sense of whether you liked that movie, whether it was a good movie, and a lot of it has to do with the fundamental structure of the movie. And if you, you may not have a language to talk about why you liked it. You may not know why you liked it, but a lot of it will have to do with if it followed this structure. So traditionally, as a speech language pathologist, what we look at is the work of Stein and Glenn, and story grammar includes a setting, initiating event, internal response, an internal plan, attempt, direct consequence, and reaction. And these are all fundamental, but when I try to talk to kids about stories, they don't get any of this. An initiating event that is way too abstract for them even the most concrete one on the list, setting, they don't even get what a setting is. Why? Well, if you've lived in one place, and remember a lot of our students, especially lower socioeconomic students, they don't have a breadth of a lot of different experiences to a lot of different settings. They've been in one place, they've been in one town, and their experience is not very wide. So to talk about a story takes place in a setting, even that is something they struggle with. English teachers often look at stories this way, with setting, rising action, falling action, and resolution. But again, with the students I work with, they, they don't necessarily get that. So, what I did is I actually looked at the way that filmmakers plot stories. This is an excellent book called The Writer's Journey by Christopher Vogler. He was a film analyst for Disney and so he was looking at why are some of these movies successful and why are some of them flops? And there's a lot at stake because it's, it's very expensive. And so these executives didn't know how to choose. How should, this seems like a really good story, but it was a total flop. And this one seemed like a, not a very exciting story and it was a runaway success. So what he did is he took the work of Joseph Campbell, the hero with a thousand faces, looked at the hero's journey, and 
across all cultures, what are the similarities in stories? And built a framework so that film analysts could look at stories and see if it contained those elements. So what I did is took his work, took my understanding of story grammar, and combined those two. Something that filmmakers often use is storyboarding. And when they create a storyboard, I haven't tried this, but I just wanted an image to kind of give you an idea, but this is a free digital storytelling online program. I can't say anything about it because I haven't personally tried it myself, but I wanted to give you an idea of what storyboarding looks like. It's a very much a visual medium. And when filmmakers, directors create stories, they create a storyboard. And they draw what they want to happen in each frame of their film. And so this is how I want my students to think about stories. I want them to take the written word and create a visual picture so that they're visualizing what is happening in the story. So already right now, your student is overwhelmed. You've been working with them for seven minutes and they can't hear another word and they are stuck, they're, they're done. So this is where insight into how our executive function works comes in, help, comes in handy. So for example, Carolee started off by telling you pretty much in a sentence, a, a phrase, what we were going to cover today. Now is a good time to stop and do a quick review of what we have covered in that five to seven minutes that we started. And one of the things that you'll notice that we covered is several places where our students have a very difficult time processing concepts. They, they have a difficult time with making a mental image of what you just said. Those of you here were thinking along the lines of, your own teachers that taught you about rising action and falling action and what your experience with that was. You were maybe thinking about your own teachers telling you that you had to approach your writing in a certain given way, following some form of cookie cutter outline or the G-O word, which is kind of like a four letter word for students by the time they're in third grade, the graphic organizer. So we really are finding that, that one of the difficulties with the writing process, we need to back ourselves up a bit and understand that it is finding its original difficulty in the fact that they have very, very slowly evolving and developing executive function. So creating a mental image is, I would say, an issue of modern times of epic proportion because it's so difficult for our students to do this. We, they're, they're confronted with visuals all day long at a, at a rate that most of us as adults, we don't accumulate that many visuals in a lifetime. But they get that amount of visual in a week. But they're not transferring into mental images. And it's the mental image that the executive functioning of our brain really, really needs. So one of the ways that we can actually support their development of mental images is by very carefully crafted review and preview. Review and preview. What did we just say in your words? What do you think is coming next? Or that is what was just said. This is coming next. And one thing I would really encourage you to do while you're engaging in the review and preview is park your pronouns at the door. And as writers, this is gonna be something that will challenge. We, we will have to have pronouns in our language all the time. But when you're working with a student on writing, try very hard to have the content be the, the content of what you say, rather than what did I just say or what did you just say, and make it more, we, that was just covered, that comes next, and then that's where we'll end up. 
It's a, it's a slightly different way of thinking about it, but if you can do that, it makes it possible for the student to actually engage in review and preview of their own. The mental image that is created when a, a teacher says, I want you to, is very, very different, and I would hazard, I would go so far as to say, it's been weakened by that. So the next, executive function skill set that we are trying to establish so that the student has a, a baseline to work from is the ability to see events in time. And this, again, is actually hindered at levels that I have never seen in all of my teaching career. I have never seen so many students so incapable of forming a mental image of time. They, they don't have a sense of time. They might not even know the order of the months of the year, et cetera. So, so you have a very interesting challenge if you're asking a student to engage in a writing process that involves development through time of a character or a series of events, and they can't see time, then maybe that's where you back it up to and do a little bit of work with that to establish. And then there is the attention to detail. We'll be speaking about this the rest of the morning with, in various ways, but one of the things to keep in the back of your mind is when students are being asked to write, these story structures that Carol Lee has already referred to don't often work well because they are a single directional setup you start from the beginning and you work to the end. And it seems fairly logical that that would be an acceptable way to work. But in writing and with our students that have a little bit of executive function challenge, that becomes a difficult, possibly even inappropriate way to try to get them to write. And you'll find out a lot more about that fairly challenging comment as we go into the rest of the program. But, but this is just a little, a little uh, diagram that Carolee and I put together, and I want to tell you how we did this, because this is going to be possibly something where a few of the other things that you've learned about in this conference might link together. We did this on an iPad Pro, on a, just a note, notepad application, and I did it this way because what I'm discovering is that not only do our dyslexic students have difficulty writing, they may also have difficulty writing and have some, some forms of dysgraphia. And I have started using the iPad Pro with the pen, the big one, with my dysgraphic students because I can blow the screen up really big and they can see just a piece of it and then when you bring the screen back down, it looks like they just wrote something in normal size and in the right order. Miracle. So we, we were playing around with the iPad Pro when we did this, and this took about 10 seconds. I mean, this is amazing. This is one of your meetings of our assistive technology ideas with our applications. Well, it took 10 seconds for Paula because she has good <laughs> executive function skills, but I'm the person who says, teacher, teacher, I don't remember. What was I supposed to do? How do you turn on the iPad Pro? What does that look like? So <laughs> okay. she's, she's the executive function part of this presentation for, for a very important reason. Um, she, I watched while she put this together. That was our collaboration. <laughs> These are all the things going on when your student or your child is trying to write. So no wonder this is such a daunting task. I mean, on top of all this, we have the spelling and the encoding. Uh, we have all of this, the t traditional aspects of language that a speech language pathologist looks at, the phonology, which is the sounds to be able to put them together to spell, the morphology, a, a student may be speaking correctly, but then all of a sudden they're leaving off the verb endings when they're writing. The sentence structure, the semantics and meaning, the pragmatics. Some of the things we need for writing are theory of mind, which is the ability to take the perspective of others. So there is a handout that goes into more detail on this. There, there are two handouts. One of them 
talks about the executive function piece, and then the other one is a bunch of things, graphic organizers you can use in a, more of a landscape word. version. What did you say? The go word. <laughs> we'll call it something else. So a student needs theory of mind to write. You have to be able to take the perspective of others. You need to understand social communication, the emotional content, the implication, the cause and effect of one character's actions upon another. Self-regulation. You have to have enough working memory to hold an idea and move it around cognitively. You need grammaticality judgment during writing and during the editing process. And then underlying all of that is the grit and the determination to stick with a task. And this is why when I work with high school students and they're asked to write something, they wad up the paper and throw it across the room because they've already experienced so much failure with this activity. Someone asked me, who, what age level is this presentation appropriate for? Well, as a speech pathologist, I've worked with preschool, elementary, middle school, high school kids, and in my experience is when I get to the high school level, I am seeing the same skill set that I saw in the elementary kids. They did not lag behind a little bit, they just stalled out. Some of my students in first or second grade and their reading and writing did not progress beyond that point. So the things I'm gonna share with you, in fact, I'm gonna share a picture book that I use with all ages. It's called Gingerbread for Liberty. And the reason I use this picture book. Do you want me to read or anything? Uh, not yet. Not yet, okay. Uh, the reason I use this picture book with all ages is because it's for a first to, through third grade level but it's about the American Revolution. It's about how a German baker helped George Washington win the Revolutionary War. So it ties into the curriculum, it sh it's a story, so it follows narrative structure, uh, but it's appropriate to use with your first, second, and third graders, with some modifications of what we're talking about. I've also used it with middle school, and then we bring in other texts about the American Revolution. You can use it with your high school students. Because I only have a 45 minute slot, if I wanna talk about the structure of stories, I don't have time to talk about a novel, because if I read a novel with my students, it would take all year. I wanna talk about one story, the structure of that story. So a lot of times I use these narrative nonfiction picture books because they tie into the curriculum, they're very short, I can read it one session, talk, begin to talk about the analysis of it. Um, if you have a, an OG tutoring session, consider spending five minutes of your session reading a little bit of a book like this and then talking about the story structure and exposing your students to some high quality literature because we need to remember um, that we are working very hard with them and they are working very hard and we need to remember and they need to remember why are we doing this. So decodable texts are absolutely vital to what they do but they're not going to develop a love of literature through their decodable texts. They're gonna develop a love of literature through exposure for, from us reading to them or them reading things with, through Learning Ally or through uh, Read Out Loud. So you know a lot more about stories than you think you do. The tab in my blog is called The Secret Language of Stories, not because it's a secret. You actually know a lot about stories, but we don't always have a language to use to talk about it. So we're going to give you some terms to use that you'll be able to talk about stories more effectively with your students. And there is a difference between being a good storyteller and being a good speller, and they do not always con connect at all. There are some very profound writers who have dyslexia and who are terrible spellers. And William Butler Yeats is a poet who, there was an article written about him in the Journal of Learning Disabilities asking, was he dyslexic? They look at some of the writing he did about himself and his struggles in school. And of course we know about Henry Winkler and some of the other writers who have great stories to tell. And so it's important uh, that we not have our kids stall out with the spelling. Just because you're not a good speller doesn't mean you're not a good writer or storyteller. We actually did this session at the Southwest Branch for students. It was a three hour session. I spent 90 minutes talking about the structure of stories and the second 90 minutes we had an occupational therapist who came in with iPads for every child with a PowerPoint following this structure and they all, and she gave them strategies for how to use voice to print. 
so that they were able to record their voices, to create print, and by the end of our three-hour session, they were coming up and sharing their stories. And so that was, that was very powerful for us. So technology is very important for writing. All right, so there are 12 elements to consider when analyzing stories with the secret language of stories, which is the analysis that, that, I have, uh, that I've created. And it may seem like a lot, but we're gonna not only break it down, but we're going to use visual images. Now, in your handouts, you have this list, you don't need to write it down because it's in your handouts, but I've also bolded certain things. So, for instance, ordinary world relates to setting. So, if I, we wanna compare this, if you're a speech pathologist and you wanna compare this to the work of Stein and Glenn, and you wanna know, has my student included everything in their story? So, the ordinary world is the setting and the characters. The call to adventure is the initiating event. The problem, prize, and plan part of the story is the planning, and then of course we have the attempts and the response, which is all part of that Stein and Glenn story grammar. And then the reward is the direct consequences. So I've created these, story, these pictures. They're, they're not great because I made them myself, and I always tell my students that. And, and by the way, don't worry, because if you want, I went and got off Google free images, that are easy, kind of cartoon-like versions of what Carol Lee did, it's, the image itself is not the issue, so don't worry about trying to figure out these images too closely. Yes, and hard to see. Right, and so she just did that. She, for each image, she went and Googled, imaged it, and used those. Yeah, literally, and, and what I ended up doing, just to let you know how applicable this, what you're just about to hear is going to be. Through the summer, I ran several writing workshops with students where I would get anywhere from one to four students working at a time. And we, we did the, this, this story structure that we're talking about today. And I ended up with a massive amount of uh, insight <laughs> because the students were as young as third grade and as old as high school that I worked with. And it was a phenomenal experience. I, I, I'll t we don't have enough time for me to go into that, but it was really amazing. You also have these images in your handouts and on my blog, under the Secret Language of Stories, if you go to the very bottom, there's actually a PowerPoint where each of these pictures is discussed in detail with examples from movies and books that you could just show the PowerPoint and do it with your, with your students. Um, because of my executive function, or my executive dysfunction, I put it on YouTube, that's, that's how I figured out how to do it. So it keeps running, you'll have to pause it. <laughs> yeah. All right, so these are the images I'm working on with an artist, and not yet at the point where I'm ready to disseminate these, but we're working on a process for doing that. So I'm gonna use this, as you can see now, that list of 12 items that I gave you, when you use pictures, whether you use your own pictures or whether you use these pictures, now suddenly, this becomes a little bit more manageable. And you'll notice that they're organized into frames. And so we have the beginning of the story is for elements. The middle of the story is four elements, and the end of the story is four elements. So we have the ordinary world, the contrast between the ordinary world and the new world. So characters start out in their boring, ordinary world. And a trick that authors use is the more you, separation between those two things, the more excitement for your story. So for instance, in a movie like The Wizard of Oz, not only is she on a farm and life is boring and the mean lady next door wants to get rid of her dog, all these things are going wrong. If you watch closely, you'll notice it's in black and white. When she gets to Oz, everything is in color. And so this is, be, become aware of this and as you're talking with your students about it, the, when I have these conversations, they start to say, oh yes, I noticed that, and they will come up with suggestions. What is the ordinary world, and what is the new exciting story world? And typically at this point, we would ask you for your examples, but we don't have time, so we're just, I'm just gonna throw out some examples to you, but do, when you're sitting with your students, and with the PowerPoint that's on my blog, I'll give some examples, and then I ask them, now what can you think of? Can you think of a story where you really see a contrast between the ordinary world and the new world. Uh, Harry Potter on Privet Drive versus Hogwarts. <laughs> Cinderella goes to, you know, she's, she's slaving away for her stepsisters, then she goes to the ball. 
And then the next one is the call to adventure. And a call to adventure could come through letters coming in through your, through your chimney and your fireplace, as in <laughs> Harry Potter. It might be a letter that you receive to a ball. Or it could be an internal stirring, like I, I want to become an Olympic athlete. All of these things are different calls to adventure. And then we have mentors, guides, and gifts. So we have the call and we have the response to the call, which is often, I can't go, I can't do this. Um, and the, more, the higher the stakes in the story, the more resistant of the hero to start off on the journey. And so even Harry Potter, the famous boy wizard, said, I'm, what's special about me? And Hagrid said, well, hasn't anything unusual ever happened to you? And he remembered certain occasions with his cousin Dudley. And so there is a resistance in uh, Star Wars, uh, Luke Skywalker, Obi-Wan Kenobi wants his help to find Princess Leia, and he says, I can't possibly leave the farm. Well, so... There are men, a mentor is the person who gives you encouragement and possibly gifts, such as Cinderella. I can't possibly go to the ball. I don't have anything to wear. So her fairy godmother intervenes and says, well, I have a dress for you, and I have shoes, and I have a pumpkin coach. This is something that's a recurring theme in Greek mythology are the types of gifts that the mentor gives to the hero to get him going on his journey. So then he's ready to go, and he is, there's a crossing there's a threshold that's crossed over. Sometimes it's just a decision to act. Other times you actually get in a vehicle. Often you get in a train and go to Hogwarts. You get in a pumpkin coach and you go to the ball. And that's the beginning of the story. That's the beginning section of the story. The middle of the story we start out in a new world, and this is where in comedies, fish out of water stories, someone is in a, uh, they're trying to get used to this new place. If you remember Miss Congeniality, she's an FBI agent, and then she's thrust into this beauty competition where she's got to act like a beauty competitor. And so this is a great opportunity for comedy. Even if it's a serious story, this is a good place for comedy where the, you are not in your environment, you are not in your element, and so this new world presents small challenges that you have to understand to navigate this world. Next part is problems, prizes, and plans. For a long time when I worked with students, I told them you have to have a problem in your story, and they would just say, ah. Oh. Well, why do we get that response from our students? Why is it difficult for them to create obstacles and problems? Well, they have enough problems of their own, in their own life, why would I want to fabricate more problems? Another thing is they also know that this is a trick to make the story longer. And this is what, right? So this is what authors do. Watch any movie or any TV show, just as you think the problem's about to be solved. Oh no, now there's something else. They solve that and oh no, there's something else. These obstacles keep arising. Well, if you're not comfortable with your writing, you don't want to prolong the agony of writing the story. You don't want a problem that you've created. You want to get right to the end. Of course, that's not the way stories are constructed. So I began talking to students not so much about problems, but the fact that we have a goal or an aim in a story. And sometimes it is to solve a problem, but not always. Sometimes it's a prize. So for instance, in the movie Friday Night Lights, the Odessa football team wants to win the state championship. That's the prize. That is the ultimate goal. Problems arise and obstacles arise. So if a story starts with a prize, then obstacles will arise. If a story starts with a problem, then there will be a prize that needs to be attained to solve that problem. So Dorothy has to get the witch's broomstick. And so there's something, you know, someone may need, if a dragon needs to be slain, perhaps there's a sword that has to be found and attained. If a mystery needs to be solved, the problem is someone is dead, and a mystery needs to be solved, the prize is finding clues or finding a piece of evidence. And so that seems to help them kind of wrap their mind around, it's not always a problem. And that relationship between a problem and a prize. Then plans come in. Okay, now what are you going to do about it? Next is the midpoint. Something happens at the midpoint of a story. In shorter stories, you might not have a midpoint. You might go straight to the climax. But in longer stories, 
there's going to be some sort of big attempt, and again, this could be the preliminary, like if, if you want to pass a class, you want to do well on the final exam, you have to pass the midterm first. If you want a, uh, you want to win the state championship, you have to win the regional championship first. And then there's downtime, so you've, you've made this attempt, and if things have gone well, you're celebrating. If things have not gone well, then you're probably licking your wounds and making a new plan. So this is a little misleading because it's not to scale. The middle of the story is usually quite longer, and what makes the story longer is the repetition of the plan, attempt, and response cycle. And that's what, what makes this format work for a picture book and also work for War and Peace because you have your beginning section, you have your end section, and in the middle you have this constant repetition of making a plan, making an attempt, and then responding to what happens, and then you make a new plan, a new attempt, and a new response. And, and this is exactly the point where we can really understand our students' relationship to time. Because most writing teachers tell students you need to start at the beginning, and you need to write to the end. That is not an uncommon thing for people to be told. Over the summer, what I did, and I'd like to share this with you because I think it would illustrate what we're talking about in terms of the writing process and executive function. I had these more cartoony, colorful Google images. I laminated them maybe two by three inches, not very big, put that little strip of magnetic tape on the back and put them on a simple whiteboard right, a $10 whiteboard that was magnetic. And that was our storyboard. So then the students had the storyboard in front of them. They, we had talked about these, so they, they knew roughly what those different icons meant. But not a single one of them started at the beginning. Their ideas started somewhere else on the board. So one, one girl started with the new world. And then she said, this is what I want to write about, what happens in the new world. And as soon as she put her ideas down there, it dawned on her how she was going to get there. So then she backed up and started writing the steps of arrival. Then she jumped down after, you know, under the second or third line even, and she started filling in things as her picture formed. And she said, I'm not going to write about that very first one until I'm sure of where I'm going. And that was a very well articulated comment about the writing process. She let me inside her head. And I, I, I was very careful not to interfere with her process because I was, I was seeing what was going on. By the end of that workshop time, she had written about 12 pages of a story that was borderline publishable. She then went and got her own images off, you know, off of Google, and she had this amazing fantasy story that was kind of a cross between a fairy tale and a myth set in the context of a modern girl. And I was truly surprised because this was not what I w went into this process expecting to see. This was a very short amount of time, but her production was prolific because I let her, through this structure, I let her go her path of process the way that she could do it. She did her own review and preview. She did her own mental imaging. She did her own establishment of her relationship to time. So that's why we're, we're trying to highlight the background skills of executive function to this. The structure does not need to be followed. One, two, three, four, five, six, et cetera, so on. Mm -hmm. So as soon as you understand that, try it for yourself if you want. But as you, and, and you get more in the handout, you get more descriptions of what these 12 icons really represent. And she ended up not using all of them. I think she used 10 of the 12. But the story was beyond b unbelievable because without that structure, that story would have never come to light. It, so I just want that to be in the back of your minds as a practical application. You could do this with a group of students this afternoon and you'll be surprised how much this can work. 
one other quick question. Um, I, I know it, the, it, it's hard to take questions from the audience, but just to clarify the questions that are coming through from the remote uh, participants. What Carolee is referring to is uh, with that storyboard, the graphic organizer, what she put on the iPad, that is in the handout. And the only way, you can easily upload it. You don't need a special app. It's just a Word document. And you can upload it onto an iPad and have students type directly into it. So It's that, not in the handout. It isn't? So, oh, so it's let on me your blog. Well, let me clarify. Okay. Yes. Okay. So we're getting some questions about what I described, which was the, the writing that I did with the occupational therapist. And what that actually was, it was a PowerPoint. And what I noticed about my students, I was working at a high school at that time, is their dream job was they all wanted to be video game designers. So I said, okay, well, you know, it's interesting to me that a lot of these video games have interesting stories. And they said, oh, yes. And they started telling me, you know, the, the storylines for these videos. And so what I did was I created a PowerPoint dovetailing this with the idea of creating a video game. Like, okay, who's the main character of your video game? And so for each of these slides, I had something like, who's the main character of your, of your, video, of your video game? What is their call to adventure? Is there someone that helps them? Do they get cool stuff? A lot of times in video games, you get cool stuff. Um, how do they get to the new world? And so that's what I did. I don't have that readily accessible, and that's what people are asking about. It, it's actually a really good writing template, and it's a good graphic organizer Got because it. each page of the PowerPoint says, on this page, write this. And we started with visual images. Go find on the internet, find a picture of a mentor, now write this about your mentor. Find your hero and write this so they had a visual image to inspire their writing. I, uh, I don't have that, but I will create that and make <laughs> that available. I might not be able to do the PowerPoint, but I could at least do it as a, like a handout that you could then create your own PowerPoint around. So, and that would probably be a link in my newsletter. So, so sign up for that if you want that so I can keep in touch with you. Okay, so that's the middle of the story. I'm gonna quickly go, because we're, we're getting short on time. Um, then we have the chase and escape. There's a twist after the downtime. So in Beowulf, Beowulf kills Grindel. Everybody's celebrating. Well, there's a twist. Grindel has a mother. So now there's a, what's that? There's, there's a twist. And now he's got to go deal with Grindel's mother. And so then we have death and transformation, which is a, a change, a fundamental change in the main character and a transformation. And then we have the climax. What is the big climax of the story going to be? Things have been building towards this, but what is the big final showdown? And then the reward, and the reward can be things like, uh, at the end of Harry Potter, there's always some sort of celebration. It could be a wedding, it might be a funeral, or something to that effect. All right, so Gingerbread for Liberty is a book I use a lot because it does con contain a lot of these elements. And so this is a storyboard I created, and you see that we have these frames of the story. I put keywords in there with the beginning, the middle, and the end. And so what I'll do is I'll read the story. So for those of you who are working with younger kids, if I were working with older kids, I would go frame by frame through the PowerPoint that's on the blog, and I would have a discussion about it. But younger kids, if they're in first or second grade, they may not have a lot of experience to draw from to give you examples, or if you're talking about The Wizard of Oz, they may or may not have a connection to that. So what I do is I give them a, a brief overview of these things, not expecting it to sink in very deeply for someone who's six, but give them an exposure to it, and then I will share a book, and then we will storyboard it. So what we'll do is I'll read the book, and I will draw pictures, and I um, not a great artist, which is helpful because these are stick figures. It's not intended to be great art. And so this is in your handouts as well, in the landscape version. So these are tiny little boxes. If you look at the landscape version, you have a little bit more room to write. And so I have keywords. I draw, I, I talk to the students about what's going on in the story. So this is the beginning and the middle of the story. This is the end of the story, and then I provide vocabulary words. So I might do it like this, where I have the vocabulary words already available to them, or I might generate that list with them. So 
This is the Cinderella version. This is not in your handouts, but this is just, we're all familiar with the Cinderella story, so she's, she's cleaning the cinders, let's draw that. And I'll draw a stick figure, it, this is not great art, I don't want them spending 20 minutes drawing this, I just want them to create a visual image. She gets an invitation to the ball, what does that look like? Her fairy godmother comes and brings her glass slippers, I might just have a picture of a shoe. This is a picture of me doing, this is another book I really love. It's called Six Dots. It's the story of Louis Braille and how he, as a blind child, created the Braille writing system at the age of 15. This is what the storyboard looks like, me doing it with my students. And so I go frame by frame, talking about, so what's his ordinary world? Well, his father was a carpenter, and he wanted to play with the tools, but one day he grabbed the awl and he poked his eye, then his eyes got infected. So the call to adventure was, he was blind, but he wanted to read books. He had an internal stirring of wanting to read books. Well, there was a noble lady who sent a letter to a school in Paris for the blind and wanted him to go. So she was a mentor and a helper, and what she gave was a letter to help him go on his way. He goes to Paris to the blind school, but when he gets there, the food, that's a plate of food there. As you can see, my drawing is not great. <laughs> oh, yum. <laughs> and that, it was not good. And the beds were close together, and some of the kids were me, and that's his new world. Now he's in Paris. But he finds out only the best students get to go to the library to read books, so he makes a plan. His goal, the prize is the books, and the plan is to be an A-plus student so he can be one of those students to go read the books. He gets there, and guess what? A word is as big as his hand because they're raised letters. So you can imagine there aren't very many books in the library, and the pages are huge, and the words are huge, and he becomes very discouraged, and he goes to bed without any dinner, and he's very depressed because how much can you read when every book is, is huge? But then someone from the military comes and visits the school and says, I have a code. It's with raised dots. I think maybe your kids would enjoy it. So he experiments with that, he, he likes it, he goes to this, this army official and says, I think we could create a writing system. And the guy says, uh, no, you know, that is, that's not within his scope of duties as a you know, French army officer. And so he's now discouraged. But he goes through this transformation where as a young man, he feels defeated, but he decides, I'll do it myself. He spends years working on this code. And while everyone else is out playing and doing other things, he's in the attic working on a code. And then the reward is he comes up with the braille writing system. That's the whole story right there. I share that picture book. We draw, as you can see, there are words that we brainstorm together on the board. I'm putting a period here, why? Because each of these pictures is going to be one to two sentences. And then the whole row is going to be a paragraph. So if I were to ask you, what is your student's definition of a paragraph? I, I ask the student, I ask the group, and they all say the same thing. There is a rule. This goes back to talking about rules. Are they internal rules or are they real rules? Well, the rule is, and you know what the rule is, it's five sentences. Actually, at the last session, someone said three. It just keeps going down. It used to be nine. That's all they know, but my students don't even really know what a sentence is. So what this organization does is it helps them to realize that a sentence is a unit of information. And so it's going to be one to two sentences or more for the first frame, one to two sentences for the second frame. By the time you get to the end of that row, you have four to eight sentences. That's going to be your paragraph. And the organization is, because we've already talked about the organization of what goes into the beginning of a story is, that first paragraph covers the beginning of your story. Same with the second row. So I make a point to make a big dot, say this is going to be one to two sentences. Uh, and then I do a little squiggly line or something to say, now when you get to the end, this is the end of your paragraph. Go back and indent. And I have to say that over and over again, even with all these visuals, because the paragraph just gets lost and they just keep going on and on. And of course, a lot of my students, they, they don't get what a paragraph is. They don't get what a sentence is. So to tell them that a paragraph is four to five sentences, they don't really get what a sentence is. And so they'll write an entire page 
and then they'll stop and remember they're supposed to make a period, and so they've got a whole page with a period at the end, and that's their concept of a sentence. So imagine if you thought you had to do five of those to make a paragraph, that would be pretty daunting. We're not gonna get into the actual sentence writing because there's a lot of really good products out there uh, that are available here, such as Framing Your Thoughts by Project Read. I know Nyehaus has some really good sentence writing materials. Uh, Van Cleve has some good writing matters to delve into the structure of a sentence, but I find it much better to talk about subject and predicate than to talk about nouns and verbs because sometimes nouns act like adjectives and sometimes adjectives can be nouns and sometimes verbs can act like adjectives. And so that all becomes very muddled and confusing. But I know what the subject of the sentence is and if I have a picture and I know the subject of a sentence is this boy and he's, the action is he's poking himself in the eye, I know what the subject and the predicate is. So, and also we talked about rising action and falling action and it, stories really aren't that way. They don't go straight up and straight down. We have all these nuances of stories and it's in those quiet moments that, that kids have a harder time identifying what's going on. But it gives us the chance to talk about character development. We have eight and a half minutes, so... Oh, and then we have an editing toolbox. This is also in your handouts. Kids also have an extreme difficult time with editing, and what I suggest is giving them one specific thing to do. So, as, an, as a professional writer, I might go through an entire manuscript and do something like, I might have an editor say to me, you know, I think your story would be better in first person, and I've written 300 pages in third person. I know, ouch, right? Um, or another writer, I belong to a critique group and we critique each other's writing and they say, I think your story would be better in third person and you've written it in first person. So one of my goals might be to go through the whole story changing first person to, second, or to third person. Uh, so for a student, I might say, add two describing words. This is your goal right now, just add two describing words. Because if you just tell them to edit, they don't have any sense of what that is. Or look for sentences, well, they don't, they don't get that. So, um, and, and look at this list in relation to this, these few executive function concepts that we started with. If you're talking subject and predicate, there needs to be a mental image, not only of what you're talking about, but you need a mental image of action, a sense of what is happening. And sometimes it's easier to get the sense of what is happening before you have the words for it. And then when you're talking about later on adding descriptive words, you, if you close your eyes and try to, to just say what picture is in your mind's eye, sometimes you get those, those adjectives without using the word adjective. Too many of our students shut down when they hear this kind of vocabulary that they don't have an inner, experience, uh, inner experience with. And so by, by having a, yourself entering into these images a little bit more fully and a little bit more with the idea of you creating mental images of what they're trying to express, that's very supportive to just this editing process. And you can also ask them in terms of time. So the, the description you're giving right now stands in what part of your story. And every time they have to retell where they are in context, it becomes more clear to them what they're really writing. And that, that, that can be a very uh, key place where you can use the executive function skill set to enhance writing. A lot of times this will remain as inference if we use the vocabulary without giving them inner access to the experience of it, it just becomes so much, so much vocabulary that washes over them without really landing. So be careful what you ask them to do. So check your <laughs> spelling. Well, how am I supposed to check my spelling if, if I didn't know how to spell it the first time? So right. here, here's a practical hint. I gave you a list of words. The list of words I gave you with the character names and places, those were spelled correctly. Go back and look, <clears throat> because this is something students Ooh, don't, don't do. Don't touch your throat. <laughs> Oops. Oh, sorry. This is something students don't do, is the word is right there on a list. Check that. 
So use that to check your spelling because you know that is spelled correctly. So that's a tool that's practical. Um, well, that also hmm. separates out. And here, here's another thing is writing teachers and teachers of even high school students, we tend to forget how separate these activities are for our students. The act of spelling, that, that has a whole section in, for example, an OG lesson. And it has all of these different sections, like Carolee put on the very first slide, all of these different activities, which are literally brain activities of language processing, have to all come together for the writing process. So you have the, the entire context and content of writing, then you have, as she's pointed out, all of the, the writing mechanics pieces, and then you have the student's overall learning capacity and expressive capacity as a, as a student altogether, and they're all dependent on whether or not the executive function is working together in the background. If that is working in the background, then they can go, they can make the shift from focusing on a adjective. Ah, now I have to know how to spell it. So now I have to remember all of those things. Oh, now I have to put it in the context of other words to give it meaning. So it is, a, it is <clears throat> the most complex process, language process that we ask our students to engage in. So by supporting them with this story structure, you're actually supporting their most challenging area of language production. So we have three and a half minutes. I'm going to spend 30 seconds talking about <clears throat> this editing toolbox, and then we will have time for just a couple of questions. So one thing about sentences is that what kids do is instead of putting a period, if you look at um, capital, no, if you look at spelling, no, look at periods. <laughs> Every time you use the words then, so, and, go through your paper and circle it. Because this is what kids do instead of creating periods. They say, and then, and then, and then. So one of the ways you can do to figure out if you can create a new sentence is to circle that. And if you've used more than one, then you should create a new sentence. Now, is the next piece of information containing both a subject and a predicate? If so, then it may be its own sentence. So that's all I'm going to say about that because we now have two and a half minutes. We have, do we have people with microphones? If, you know, we have a mic there. Do we have any questions? And I apologize that we have so little time. Again, if you want to direct questions to my blog, we will write some up. Uh, but are there any questions right now? And make sure your blog goes up on the screen. Does it? And so let's go back to the beginning where the blog is. And it's in your handouts as well. It's caroleedeanbooks.blogspot.com. And you can go to the contact section and just send me your question. And then we will collaborate in the next week or so to answer those questions for you and then create a whole page of, of questions. But if anybody has a burning question right now that they would like to ask, you have two minutes. <laughs> okay, so let's see. No, um, the, the rest of the questions were, were addressed. We have addressed. Okay. This isn't a question. All right. Yeah. Okay. In, well, thank you for being an audience allowed to be live streamed. Oh, we have one question. One question. I'm actually working on that, and that's something that will probably be available later. The question this is, do we have a book, does Carol Lee have a book that goes into more detail with all the resources and enhances what we just said? And the yes, answer is... That's coming. Soon. That is coming. <laughs> so if you sign up for the newsletter, I'll give you updates on that. If you look on the blog, there's some of that already up there. And there are actually several stories that are completely analyzed. There are links to stories that are completely analyzed on there already for you. Yeah. And let me know if you want any help with doing it in a tutoring session outside the classroom. Yeah. Yes. Mine or her? Uh, helping students take control of everyday executive function. It's the one with the sticky notes on it. Okay, thank you. Good. 35 seconds to spare.